Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. We're gonna give people a minute or two uh, just to get situated if they're a minute or two late and then we will get started. I think we need some of that music you were playing before. Uh, all right, everyone. Um, on that note, um, thank you everyone for joining us. This is gonna be a super uh, special event, something a little different than kind of the usual stuff that we do. This is gonna be a, an open discussion. Um, we don't have any slides. We have a couple bullet points and I'm going to encourage everyone to jump in. If you want to ask a question, make a comment, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or let me know. Um, and we'll see if we can work some people to come. We want it to be interactive. Uh, we really wanted to put our finger on the pulse of this holiday season, which is shaping up to be one for the record books as we come out of Corona and now head into a recession. Um, still waiting to, to, for the other shoe to drop there. But we're going to let everyone introduce themselves, and then we're just going to jump in and, and talk shop. So guys, who wants to go first? I'll kick it off. I'm Brian, uh, head of trust and safety at Dodgeball. I like to just say I'm a fraud fighter who's infiltrated the provider side of things. So uh, I built a handful of fraud and trust and safety teams out, um, and mainly being a team of one-on-one. -on -one. So my eye might start twitching a little bit as we talk a little bit deeper into holiday season. Hey, everybody. Sean, Senior Fraud Investigator for the Global Fraud Operations Team at JustEatTakeaway.com. We handle all matters of fraud for all the different stakeholders. Those are our customers, couriers, restaurant partners, and internal fraud with employees. Been at the company now for about four years and come from a behavior and data, security, all sorts of things that led me into this from before that. Hey, everybody. My name is Alexander Hall. Uh, I'm the owner of Dispute Defense Consulting and the host of the Fraud, Pre fraud Prevention Roundtable Series. Uh, I have almost 16 years of, of fraud-related experience. For those who don't know, 10 of those years were spent operating as a fraudster. Uh, I have been, I switched sides from the Sith to the Jedi. Uh, and now I'm on a fraud prevention team and have been for nearly six years. Uh, I consult with merchants on strategy, strategy development. I consult in various SME capacities with different vendors. Uh, and I work with amazing publications like the Merchant Fraud Journal on webinars, blogs, public speaking events, and otherwise. This is awesome. Thank you guys so much for letting me be a part of this. Let's have fun. All right. Awesome. Um, okay. So I'm Bradley. I'm the face behind the name, the articles, the editor-in-chief and co-founder here at Merchant Fraud Journal. Um, and we're just really excited to have everyone here. So thank you guys uh, for taking the time. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, so this holiday season, man, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty incredible, I think, because it's such a unique environment. So I don't know which one of you guys wants to start off kind of talking about how we're rolling into this season and uh, how as a fraudster, you would be looking at this type of type of uh, environment that we're facing right now. I think before we get into all that, a lot that gets overlooked within businesses is the actual stress and toll that's put on fraud fighters. Um, I know that when earlier in my career, I had a lot of challenges, like I'm kind of figuring out, like, how do you actually educate people of this time is a little bit different. You are getting pressures from leadership to get as many through. If you're dealing with physical goods products, you have to make more decisions faster, volumes coming up. And if you don't get your decisionings done in time, you're breaking SLA. So that overnight shipping is now no longer overnight. There's a lot of different pressures uh, to kind of maximizing that revenue. And within that, 
you're probably getting a little bit of bad fraud advice of, hey, we should just lack some rules right now. And being able to take that or educate people or run with that puts you in a weird position um, because you also don't want to have too much friction at that point of people actually saying, take my money, take my money. So that weight that we as fraud fighters carry during this time is a lot. And I hope that today we can kind of walk through how to navigate that to really help us and our community find our voices to really uplift each other because it isn't easy to get through this. Awesome, Brian. Before before you guys jump in, on, I'm going to do an awesome segue here. Uh, we are giving away free stuff, as we said. All of these gentlemen, I, I think Brian, did you? I don't think you've gotten the package. I never got your address, but but Sean and Alex have definitely sampled the hot cocoa. I think you guys can. Ah, uh, oh, he's got the mug. Look at this. Look at this product placement. I love it. I love it. So the first uh, the first participant here is Donna Roizen. Roizen, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if you're not. Um, and we're going to be sending um, her or him. I think her. Uh, I don't want to. I apologize if I'm not saying that correctly. But we're going to be sending you a free um, a free package with a lot of hot chocolate and a lot of mugs. Um, and Donna is joining us from Target or Target, as we like to call it in my family. So thank you so much, Donna. If you email me. Uh, at Bradley at merchantfraudjournal.com. I'll be sure to get that out to you if you send me your your uh, snail mail address and we'll send it out to you in the mail. All right, continue guys. Congratulations. First winner. I need a price is right drop. We don't we need to. <laughs> yeah, I want to follow up with what Brian was mentioning there. Uh, so yeah, holiday time does become more difficult for fraud fighters. There's a lot going on. As you mentioned, volume goes up. You know, the desire to open things up so that more orders get through, regardless of what market you're in, is absolutely there. You want to make it as easy, frictionless for the customer as absolutely possible, because um, this is the time that everyone's going to be spending. Um, and with that, you know, with the way the economic situation is in the world right now, as Bradley had mentioned, you know, we're falling into a recession and that's going to open up a lot of doors for a lot of potential fraud to slip through those cracks that we are actually opening into caverns, right? We're making canyons out of these things um, to make the holiday experience better for our client base. And with that, you know, I honestly think that we're going to see a lot more friendly fraud coming through because people are just trying to make ends meet, recoup some of those funds that they put out. So that's that first party misuse. We're going to see a lot more policy abuse coming through. So that's people abusing your vouchers, your coupons, your refund and return policies. Again, a lot of people don't feel that is fraud. You know, they're just working the system a little bit, cooping some money, um, saving some cash. And then from that, from the fraud side, I feel and see, start, starting to see the explosion across the industry already is a real big growth in triangulation fraud those discount offerings to customers through all sorts of different means on the surface web, you know, get 50% off this gift card, this order, this product, whatever the case may be. And then used uh, using either stolen credit card credentials or an account that's been taken over to then place those orders for their own client base. It's on the rise already. And we're just going to see more of it in these hard times. Alex, why is that really even rising? Like, what do you think from your perspective? So as if both of those perspectives weren't enough, now you enter the mindset of a fraudster. Cool. Well, when we consider this, what are we seeing? Fraudsters are going to approach any type of merchant, any type of operation with a new, pet, with a new set of eyes. During the year, and as you mentioned, Brian, uh, you know, rules and processing and processes are being built up in order to establish normal flow of traffic and all that stuff. Fraudsters are aware that when the holiday season comes, generally speaking, all merchants are expecting a difference in the spending habits. We see gift cards go up. We see discounts being employed. We see marketing going out. We're getting into the Black Friday stuff. We know all of these things happen. In addition to that, fraudsters are aware that it now becomes commonplace for people to send items 
to addresses that are unassociated to the billing address. In addition to this, we're aware that new people are being seen at new platforms. Maybe I've never shopped at Gucci before, but my, my wife's sister wants that handbag. So I've never shopped there before. I'm going to be a new customer of the Gucci place, right? I'm going to be a new customer there. I know that these spending habits change. And that's just from the outside looking in. Then you got to consider uh, that the methods that have been deployed throughout the year are going to be done en masse, right? Because now we know that these, that these uh, gateways are open. So it's going to be a repeat of what we've seen throughout the year, except every single fraud operation is going to do it more per volume and all of that. Uh, and, and then in addition to that, there's just a, a lot of caveats that are being experimented with. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that there's a set of information that's aggregated over time. Does this work? Does this work? Let's save this for Christmas. Let's save this for Black, for Black Friday. Let's save this over here and, and use it strictly for the holiday season. Um, really the gloves come off. And so as if those two perspectives weren't enough to, to raise our stress levels during the holiday season, um, the landscape shifts as well uh, through the eyes of a fraudster, 100%. Yeah, yeah it's just so, think... so much easier to hide, so much easier to get through with loosened restrictions. Yeah, and kind of it brings me back to what you said, Alex, of like, there was this one specific scenario that I saw really every year on a physical goods, but it was only during the holidays because the idea are people were traveling. So we'd have uh, packages be delivered to addresses that were either for sale or were known to that people weren't there year round. Uh, we needed to sign. So usually they wouldn't get delivered to the address, hopefully. Hopefully, that's not always perfect, but it would end up being returned to a specific hub of insert the carrier. And we started to notice a trend of our higher value products. Our AOV went up for these types of orders, but then we're not being returned all the way back to us, but weren't being delivered. And then we're finding out that they're being picked up at the hub uh, without confirmation. So we are seeing these redirection not even redirection, non-delivery of shipments, but that are being picked up at specific hubs. 100%, yeah. That used to be a method that, that I was familiar with. Um, it was all part of the equation. It was, hey, if you send out this item, maybe if I can prove to, my, to the carrier that I am who I am, maybe they'll just keep it at the post office. And then secondary to that, they typically, what they'll ask for is that you, you match the ID with the intended recipient. Well, if you're using stolen payment or stolen identity information to set up the account, blah, 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 um, you can't show up with the matching ID. So what's the quick way around that? You use your in-laws. Any in-law can be any name on the planet and no one's gonna, gonna raise an eyebrow. Oh, hey, I'm out of town. Save that at the, at the post office. I'll send my brother-in-law to come get it. His name is. That last names don't have to match. It's easy peasy. Um, there were some times where I would ask, I'd say, hey, yeah, can we can we set this up for a particular time? He'll be here. I want to be as secure as possible because I don't want fraudsters to get a hold of my package. Play the whole game out. So to your point, that's one that's one piece of the equation that that I regularly employ. Yeah. Yeah, those middleman methods, they really work out. For the fraudsters like for example the triangulation fraud that was spoken of basically you know the customer places an order thinking they're going to get a discount to some merchant uh marketplace somewhere or some social media group that's expressed that hey they can get them this deal whatever the case may be and then give them their details to process the payment and get the order and then that fraudulent posting then places the order to the actual um, merchant to send that product to the to their customer um, using stolen credentials of some sort, either an account itself with saved payment methods on it or stolen credit card credentials. Um, and they evade that detection because sure, in the end, that account that placed the order on the genuine merchant can be stopped. But you know what, that marketplace, they're getting good reviews from their client base because the order went through successfully and they're not stopped. It almost seems like these volumes are just growing almost for me, like daily, not even yearly, daily um, from either of you where, and I know Alex, you kind of talk about this, but Sean, you just touched on it right there. 
where are these stolen information coming from? Why do we see waves and waves coming? And then during this time of the year, why does it feel like we even see even more? I think Alex would be good on this one and even touched on it. You know, he mentioned the breaches. You know, it's not always just your account being compromised, your payment credentials as well. You know, scraping of those accounts to get all that information, everything they can. Phishing, smishing, ishing, everything is out there. And they've become much more complex, uh, much more good at what they do to get that information from genuine people everywhere by any form of contact that they can have with that person. And then also, as you mentioned, Alex, and I'll let you follow up from there, is the saving of this information for this time of year. Absolutely. When we're talking about these data breaches and we're talking about all these scams, these person to person scams that are going on, uh, the goal is to get a hold of primarily three pieces of information, payment information, identity information, login information. Well, we've seen the explosion of ATOs, now they're getting access to these accounts. Uh, we've also seen an increase in the, the mail theft, right? We've seen that, that that's blowing up on the LinkedIn feed. So we're seeing all of this information being aggregated at a, at a crazy rate. Um, and yeah, exactly. Uh, it's how can this information be leveraged? Now, looking back over the last uh, 12 to 16 months, we've been seeing payment information continue on its trajectory. You get payment information, you go type it into a checkout form. More of it's coming out, so more of it's being seen in our data. That makes sense. The ATOs, they learned how to leverage, you know, they learned to anticipate that most people use one password, a uh, username password combination across multiple platforms. So these fraudsters are getting a hold of Netflix account logins, or I'm sorry, streaming services logins, and going and using it with their financial institution and having successfully logging in. Um, so we've seen that explode, these ATOs. Uh, mail theft and checks that are going through the mail, physical, um, Physical payments that are available uh, through the mail are being used for what I call third-party ATOs, um, which is a, a method wherein identity information can be used to make an account over at a fintech platform A, um, and then use limited information to get access to the transaction history at established financial institution platform B, and use a light access over here to verify micro deposits and, and, and then essentially fund the, the fintech account. So I called that third-party ATOs. That's something that was going on a decade ago. Um, and we're just seeing this rise. Now, the one thing that I don't think we've seen an a in, influx of, an explosion of yet, which I think is right around the corner, is uh, true identity theft. Now, I had a chance to speak with a vendor yesterday uh, at Money 2020 about uh, synthetic ID fraud or synthetic ID fraud. Yeah, yeah. Um, as People that are here, we've heard a million definitions of this. What's one example? What's one example? What's one example? The idea that gets me is uh, it's a bunch of unverifiable information being leveraged for credit applications. And I think that's that's a crazy exploding trend that's happening um, that I can't quite understand. So we've seen that explosion. But what I've I'm talking seen a about bunch of that bunch of that in the past year, kind of like with yeah. my visibility of things now. And it's hard. It is hard because you're taking a lot of legitimate information and kind of mashing it all together that it's like, all right, well, here's a hit, here's a hit. It's a fuzzy, but high confidence hit. And then it's, it, it's this web. It's this really yeah. tightly web that it's kind of like stuck together. So you start to pull on little bits and pieces. Some don't untangle, but if you find that bit, that trail, sometimes a rabbit hole ending up on Google page 20, but nonetheless, you find that little bit, but synthetic identities are hard and because yeah. it's different than true identity theft. True identity theft, there might be those differentiating variables of saying, hey, this person is not normally here. They don't usually do this. This isn't normally their behavior, especially if you're, you have this like full visibility of the user of like different networks. And I know there's a lot of providers out there that have that network effect to say, hey, something's off here. Um, that's kind of the difference for me in, in like kind of the past year of having either of those be a problem because they, in you need a lot of intention on both of those. And it's usually the same team or same person who's trying to differentiate is a synthetic this is a true identity theft so again we're talking volume overload we're talking right. all that stress falling onto one person and it's hard absolutely 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've seen synthetics rise to the, I mean, we've seen entire business models be centered around synthetic ID fraud, right? So, so it's, it's very real, it's, it's very much here and present. Um, but looking forward, I really think that, that the fraudsters are going to start leveraging uh, the true identity theft, true identity fraud. Um, when we speak about synthetics, it's typically going to be associated to a social security number that doesn't have a credit profile already. They go from zero up, right? Whereas with all of this information that's coming out in these breaches, um, true identity information, like the stuff that came from my past life, uh, starts to be manipulated and molded uh, in order to meet the end result. And so th there's definitely two classes. You got to se separate them completely. Um, but anyway, I expect that we're going to see for anybody who transacts with uh, personal uh, for PII data, um, we're going to see an influx uh, there as well. At least if I were still operating this way, that's what I would probably be aiming for. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to cause an influx in fraudulent situations with an industry you were wanting to speak on, Alex, there of the buy now, pay later. Yeah, let's hop into that one. So, yeah. so before we jump into the MPL, we're going to pick another um, lucky winner. Sean, Woo! you want to flash the mug? You want to, this, this fine looking uh, mug over here uh, and some great hot chocolate and other goodies. Um, so our next uh, big winner is Walter Boric. Hope I'm pronouncing that right again. Walter Boric, um, e-commerce at FedEx or e-commerce fraud at FedEx. Um, really appreciate you jumping on the webinar. Thank you. Send me your snail mail address, Bradley at merchantfraudjournal.com, and we will get that out to you ASAP. So keep going, guys. So BMPL, obviously a super hot topic. Before we jump into that, I have a very yes. nice comment about these mugs. The logo is on both sides, whether you're right-handed or left-handed or need only to the best. something else. It shows to everybody. It's great. As a lefty, it is a big issue of my life, <laughs> of the little things. I actually just learned how to use a can opener because all can openers are made for righties within the last like 12 months. Am I proud of that? No, but that's a fun fact. We only we we bring the highest quality, highest quality products to our audience and contributors. So I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed it, Sean. I I already managed to crack one of mine. I have to I have to get another one sent to me from our team. I uh, and I can't even blame it on my toddler. It was just me washing it and <laughs> I dropped it. So. <laughs> uh, I wanted to comment. You, Bradley, uh, the the MFJ is considering every use case. There, there exactly. we go. That's there the moral story. Including lefties. That was totally planned. <laughs> it was totally planned the whole time. Uh, so yeah, hopping into BNPL, uh, we've seen it explode in the traditional marketplace that's established as of today. The landscape, the landscape shifted. We see BNPL uh, pursuing inclusion throughout the marketplace, maybe getting, getting, giving access to demographics that might not necessarily get these expensive items, it gives them the opportunity to do it. So we see the drive for merchants to employ uh, and offer BNPL. Um, straight out the gate, one vulnerability that has come to mind is uh, because it isn't traditional financing, it, it takes the model, but it isn't very traditional. Um, it, it requires less verification, it requires less information. And again, Sean, I'm glad that you, you, you we connect these dots is uh, the identity information that's out there floating around, right? This is the this is a prime opportunity for a fraudster who has aggregated sets and sets and sets of identity information with sets and sets and sets of low level payment information to really capitalize on the market. And so before we started this call, I mentioned that I expect to see that BNPL is going to really take off. Uh, and explode during the holiday season. I'd be very interested to see what the results are after the fact. Yeah. I am too. And it's, it is something that's been now more on my radar a little bit more uh, for me as of late in my current role, because my other roles, it wasn't, well, one, it wasn't as popular. Um, but now it, it becomes a challenge of we, we are kind of talking, we're talking payments, we're talking identity, we're talking account takeover, we're talking sometimes liability shift, who actually owns it and who's responsible for collecting all that information. There's a lot of different complexities that kind of go into actually understanding 
who has that. So just because someone offers it, we are opening up that ATO uh, of all right, that information saved on the account to kind of continue repeat abuse as well. So there are, it's a lot more than just payment fraud. It's a lot more than just identity fraud. And that's kind of the challenge in it in itself. So yeah, something with else. That, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Sean. So I, just, I want to yeah, jump nope. in and ask you guys real quick. Something else that we're hearing is, is becoming increasingly an issue is this idea that because the, the BNPL stretches out the time frame in, in which the interaction is still ongoing, that you could be hearing from people months after. Now, obviously, the BNPL provider is paying the merchant upfront. But what people are running into here is a lot of either one, this problem is going to hit them when they're not necessarily ready for it, because you're going to have this volume and maybe your defenses are up in February, January, when you're really expecting kind of an avalanche of chargebacks. But now maybe March comes around and you're getting this whole wave of BMPL kind of when you're already past the holiday mindset. Um, that's one one concern that we've been been hearing. And the other is surrounding the policy abuse and making sure that you're creating clear lines of communication with your customers that you don't overcompensate trying to protect against this type of fraud, that you make things so convoluted for your legitimate customers when they're maybe trying to get a refund for a legitimate reason that you end up creating just horrific customer experiences that can push good people away. So if you can comment on that, I, uh, that is definitely something we've been hearing a lot about. Sean, you want to start? You're about to talk. Yeah, my comment was off that though. So I was hoping someone would follow up to Brad and then I'll- All right, back well, I can, I, was say. I can start it then. Uh, so customer experience is always top of mind. And there's a lot of times it's like, well, why is Brian showing up here? Why we can't do something? He's going to tell us, why the risk is associated, but it's it goes back to a lot of us end up in this field because we want to make right to the customer. We want to help them really just have an awesome customer experience. It when you talk about like the chargeback issue or the refund issue, it can be challenging because it's not always necessarily like to the product itself um, or regret or buyer's remorse. It can go into the tolerance of them recognizing it actually on their statement. So I'd see this for lower dollar amounts on subscription companies that someone might not remember they signed up for it. They might not notice it as a fraudulent charge because that low dollar amount on their credit debit card statement just goes right through. It might take a couple of months of that actually happening before they recognize, oh, I've never heard of this company or, oh, I forgot, I thought I canceled that or why am I still being charged for this? So that also is another complexity to buy now, pay later, is if those payments, and this goes into complete the cardholder tolerance, and that is different from like for me to you, Sean, to you, Bradley, to you, Alex, like we all probably have different thresholds of what really stands out very quickly to us as we examine our own statements, but breaking down that buy now, pay later, that one huge charge probably stands out. Breaking that up over four, six payments, 12 payments for some, that monthly payment might take several months before a cardholder actually realizes it. And then jumping in with that, you, you it's <clears throat> the general public, I wouldn't expect to be, I don't know, we've seen it. They're, they're, not, they're not experts in the way that the processing works. They're not experts in it. They bought something from merchant A, and they're getting billed by platform B. So that's another thing that raises like the clarity that you were talking about. Uh, that's, 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 that's on the surface, that's gonna be something that, that people need to be aware of and that uh, again, offer clarity in your, in your payments. Um, moving forward from there, it is, it's, I'm glad that you rose the uh, equation, right? We need to strike the balance between customer satisfaction and operator security, merchant security, whatever it is, right? We need to strike that balance. 
Um, and it's extremely important, especially in this landscape, everyone's going after what, what has been termed the Amazon model, everyone's pursuing that. So they want seamless, frictionless uh, engagements. And when, you, <clears throat> and when you couple that with the fact that frosters are coming out of the woodworks, the stress levels go up. So I think uh, in a little bit, we should focus on, you know, case by case um, strategy items that we, can, that we can do to balance this and try to get into that sweet spot in between the two. Um, but before that, Sean, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I op opened it back up to you because you did have that, that comment. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to quickly touch base on when it comes to buy now, pay later. And as you mentioned, Alex, how there's lesser validations and verifications upon these transactions. You know, you don't need a full user profile in order to put something together. So as we were talking about, um, synthetic identity and true identity, well, you don't have to the fraudster doesn't have to go and scrape absolutely everything. They just need smaller pieces and components to put it together in order to file and get through for a uh, BNPL purchase. Absolutely. And for those of you who have heard my, my breakdown on how uh, I used to, the, the long process that I used to go through uh, in order to manipulate a superficial set of information and then a credit report and then a this and a that in order to groom a, a compromised profile set of information. The truth is, in, in today's world, synthetics and BNPLs, um, it, it, it takes hours to do instead of 90 days or six months that I would experience in the past. It takes hours in order to get a compromised set of PII and then be able to turn it into something valuable. Um, so yeah, that's a huge dynamic is, is how much work has to go into leveraging the information in the BNPL setting, 100% Sean, yeah. I think um, to that, it just makes it even easier to have higher volumes coming through. For that, it's simple, it's easier. Everyone wants to find the path to least resistance. Processors are people too. They just want the easiest way to get what I want out. It could be a card testing. It could be a product. It could be mo moving money along. They just want the easiest way. And if that's the easiest way and it works, it's going to be tested and tested until it doesn't work anymore. Then they'll find something else new on your site and continue to use that method on the other sites where it does work. It's just, I mean, you've all said it. It's a piece of the puzzle. But as this volume is kind of picking up, um, Sean, what are you really looking for in this type of activity, especially of like balancing the spikes of the volumes coming through? Well, since we don't use BNPL, uh, I will just go, go into the activity that's coming through the holidays. You know, when it comes to your first party misuse, luckily there, there are some new programs coming out that the MRC has been talking about. Um, so that'll help us, you know, anyone in their dispute claims when it comes to first party misuse. So I recommend following up with their, um, posts and information on that. Uh, moving forward from there, when it just comes to fraud in general, you know, you've got your policy abusers coming through, those using vouchers, coupons, referrals, getting refunds and returns. Reevaluate your criteria and what you're putting through when it comes to what you determine to be fraudulent and just make sure you're set up for the holiday season. You know, least amount of friction that you're gonna to apply to your genuine customers. So get micro in your details really try and pick out just the baddies uh, during the holiday season. You can loosen it up again af afterwards, you know, do what you need to do. But at this time, be strict to the fraud um, and make sure that you're preventing that and not your genuine customers. Reevaluate that. Um, when it comes to what I honestly expect to have a huge boom this holiday season in that triangulation fraud, that one's gonna be a little bit more harder because a lot of the activity is happening off platform. Right? You can't shut down these additional marketplaces that are their offerings where the customers are getting these discounts. Even if you do, say you reach out to some social media site that allows for anonymous messaging that starts with a T, and you, know, and you get this thread shut down or you go on to some marketplace site that's offering actual storefronts and you get the store shut down, whatever the case may be, they'll just open up another one it's very easy to keep going that way. As soon as they're shut down, another one crops up in its place. Um, so really you have to attack the fraud on your platform, right? Look into those patterns. One good thing that you can use um, 
and I'm a big advocate for this when it comes to triangulation fraud and finding the patterns is graph network analysis, right? Graph link analysis, you can see the networks and what's going on. So you don't need to be indicative of just one certain situation. You can see the patterns amidst them and pick those out of the equation. Um, really dig down and deep into your triangulation fraud. One thing you may see is they're affecting one specific supplier, one specific product type that is getting more hits from these uh, fraudulent accounts that are going to ultimately result in chargebacks coming your way. Um, then you can see the pattern of activity around that one specific supplier or that one specific high value product that they're really trying to get their hands on. So watch for that this holiday season coming up um, and not just your standard credit card fraud doing so, but also account takeovers doing the exact same thing. Since the implementation of uh, uh, 3DS2, we've been seeing more account takeovers across the industry. And why is that? Because it's a little bit harder to just push a regular credit card transaction through. Not extremely harder, but a little bit harder. Um, so with that, with all the different phishing schemes that are going around there, like all the issues, there's an issue for any form of contact, um, all the breaches, all the attacks, gathering data, um, even the instances of mail and login information being stolen, you know, you really have to see that that is happening as well when it comes to um, the fraud that's being perpetrated on these networks now, because it's easier to use the payment method that's already saved to an account now and get that transaction pushed through than it is to use a, just a credit card. You're talking to through a lot of different behaviors. And that's what the graph link analysis is almost kind of doing, like different data points that are signaling different events of the customer journey and how they're all connected to that. Uh, you focus a lot on actually kind of creating what does fraudulent or abusive behavior look like? Are you also looking on the other end of what does a legitimate buyer look like? Are you using it that way to segment what are good signals and what are abusive signals? Absolutely, it's all part and parcel, right? Because if you're just looking at the fraudulent activity, there's gonna be some good customers that could end up potentially being caught in the mix. So you have to analyze to the point where you're able to make that separation so that you're not affecting your genuine client base. Uh, right. So you've- Yeah, no, oh, go ahead, Alex. Right. No, go ahead, go. I was gonna say, we've spoken over the course of the conversation when it came to triangulation fraud. I think we've touched on everything that it is, but what we haven't done is, is truly defined it. So I wanted to ask Sean to take 30 seconds and just for everybody watching, uh, just def just let's let's talk about what that method is real quick just so that we have the overview, because uh, you've touched on everything about it, but we haven't defined it for people who might not know what triangulation fraud is. Yeah, triangulation fraud, as its name states, you know, has three touch points. So you've got your customer, you've got your fraudster, and then you've got your merchant. So the customer sees some form of discount, places an order through a fraudster's listing of some, some so sort, and the fraudster uses stolen credentials to then place that order for the customer um, to the actual merchant that then sends it to the customer. Um, oftentimes, um, the, the uh, final purchase there is made using stolen credit cards or compromised account details or account set up potentially for a buy now, pay later service that they don't intend on paying back. Um, so, you know, everything ends up in a cycle. Uh, when it quickly, quickly, when it comes to that marketplace, as the customer enters their details, those details could also be stored um, by that fraudster who then adds that to their list to either sell those credentials to someone else or to keep perpetrating their fraud and place a purchase to some other merchant on behalf of another customer later on in their career. It's a marketplace and business of its own. Yeah, it, honestly, it's beautifully orchestrated. It's it's brilliant and it it's easy to set up. It's easy to keep going after being exposed. Um, it's very difficult to stop because it's that middleman that has no connection really to the customer because they're going to be happy with the product and the service that they received. And the merchant is going to be the unhappy one. The genuine credential holder is going to be the unhappy one. But there's no way to connect that middle ground to the actual fraudulent activity because everything is separate. It's it is really well put together. 
Yeah, when uh, uh, our friend Corwin introduced that to me and we, and we really dove down into it uh, during a phone call, it was really interesting to me because this is one of the rare occasions where my Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality traits, I, I really resonated with triangulation fraud because it's what I consider to be a multi-system exploit, right? So we're talking about triangulation, the, the, the separation between the customer fraudster on the marketplace and then the, the end user merchant the only place where fraud pops up is at the merchant but there's all this work beforehand on the previous platform that allows it to to go through and be beneficial for the fraudster to do then you talk about the resilience of it somebody finds out that there's you know a problem with this store listed on marketplace a <clears throat> they just go make another marketplace store they just go make another one and the thing that makes this super easy to set up resilient uh, and low maintenance for the for the fraudsters are um, they only have to get the images of the products. There is no building of inventory. There's nothing. So I liken this to being uh, black market drop shipping because that's effectively what it is. the The marketplace gets the order. The fraudster places the order and buys from the service provider, and they don't care if they purchase uh, if they spend more money to get overnight shipping. It's not their money. They're not worried about it. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for, for outlining it. The other piece I'd see, this isn't also only relevant to physical goods. We're making it sound like it is only relevant to physical goods. I would see this on digital subscription-based companies where they guarantee a lifetime deal to insert digital subscription or an annual deal for the price of a month. So it's like, all right, I'm gonna go purchase this. This is a no brainer and I can have access to this. And really what would happen is maybe the merchant is really good and saying, hey, this, this account has no business being on here. Okay, shut it down. That guarantee, that fraud through that marketplace, honors it, creates a new account, maybe a free subscription. They're just cycling free subscriptions, Brian one, Brian two, Brian three. Now, if you kind of find that, you can find patterns, but the better they are, the harder it is to find those. It's not just physical goods that are at risk of this. No, I agree, yeah. So guys, we have a, we have a question. Uh, I'm going to turn on John's mic here. He jumped in. I'll let him uh, say hello. John, you there? Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, good. Uh, you know, I don't remember my question. Um, okay. And juggling a couple of things, but um, yeah, no, I was just, is more of a comment that usually when you when when you guys are talking i usually just i'm more of a, a chat guy that i'll just throw on a relevant comment in the chat but if you guys don't want to do that that's okay too i'm just um juggling something else here yeah no worries no worries um we're still gonna send you a free mug and hot cocoa for being our first ever uh guest <laughs> to jump okay. in okay so sean you want to you want to show off the mug again sean's playing vanna white today on the on the webinar very nice. Very nice. The mug is also very, very good looking. It is nice. Um, I don't know. It's a really nice shade of blue and it's got these little specks in it. It's hard to see because it keeps glitching out. It's a, <laughs> it's really good looking. It's sharp. Oh, I do see. Thank you. <laughs> ah, so yes. Uh, and, and Walter says he can't wait to get his. He also wanted me to tell you that he is a lefty. So we're, we're keeping it. We're keeping it in the family, Brian. We're cool. Paying it forward. Um, awesome. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, send me, send me your snail mail address, Bradley at merchantfraudjournal.com and we'll get that out to you. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. So I, I have a question as we come up on the, the last 15 minutes here. Um, you know, I, I am interested to hear how you guys are thinking about this holiday season as we go into this recessionary environment. I mean, we're talking about, depending on who you listen to or what you want to believe, anywhere from a mild to severe kind of recessionary environment over the next year or so. How, do, how does that play in to all these types of, of uh, scams and frauds that we're seeing? Are people watching the news and attacking specific retailers based on 
if they see kind of stock valuations fluctuating, what changes? Give me, give me some top level view here of, of what people should be looking for in terms of tactics or strategies, how they're adapting to these types of uh, environment. I'll start that one off. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of information out there, right? And depending on who you're following, uh, as, a, as an operator, if you're a merchant, uh, it's very important to see what's happening in the landscape uh, elsewhere, right? So it's in my opinion, of course, I'm a little bit biased because of my background, but in my opinion, I think it's very important to think like a fraudster. Um, if I can go, if I'm targeting TVs or something like this, uh, I'm going to go wherever TVs are sold. I'm not going to go strictly to one particular merchant. Uh, and so in that, if the merchant considers, hey, here's a here's another merchant that sells similar products or they're in a similar price point or they're similarly accessible if they're both in store, online, so on and so forth. Um, and you hear about these exploits happening. The truth of the matter is by looking at it through the eyes of a fraudster, it's coming to you. I know, and I'm, I know it's a scary thing to say, but as you hear about all of these occurrences, whether it's peer to peer or person to person scams, whether it's you know internal, what is it, business, email compromises, uh, if it's phishing, smishing, vishing, all of the ings, um, no matter what it is, the truth is there's going to be a day and a time when somebody tries it against your system. So with that in mind, as we're, as we're gauging the performance in the entire community or the entire marketplace, uh, I feel it's important. The very first step is to get uh, familiar with your data. Now, I'm not telling everybody to go out and buy every single type of data, expansive data set that exists, although that would be fun. Um, understand the data that you have available to you, right? And, and understand that the goal is to make quick, accurate determinations one way or another. You gotta be accurate and as quickly as possible get to that determination, um, which is hard to do. Don't, don't, don't rush it and don't, 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 don't fly off the handle with it. Um, but that's the goal because you wanna strike that balance between security and satisfaction for everybody. Now, when it comes to these exploits, these performance or these policy performance exploits, these policy exploits. Across the board, it's pretty important to understand that the first time it's going to happen, it's going to happen because these are good customers doing bad things. None of our data, none of the data in the world can, can detect that a good customer is going to do a bad thing the first time. However, by subscribing to expansive data sets that are provided throughout our network, you'll be able to gain clarity uh, for the first time this user interacts with your website, you might be able to see that they're at risk for being for filing first, pro, first party fraud or chargeback abuse chargebacks uh, for exploiting discounts because there are some service providers that track that. Um, there are a lot of ways forward, but I think that without, uh, without spending more money to get access to more data, become very familiar with the data you have available to you and make it your goal to make quick accurate determinations where accuracy is more important than being quick, but you want to shorten that lifespan as quickly as possible. You touched on a whole lot. So I'm going to try my best to organize my thoughts into like how you talked about it. So first off, is, this is the clear and obvious one. I think the biggest takeaway from this entire uh, presentation is phishing, vishing, and smishing should be a Dr. Seuss book in itself. I think that should be the biggest takeaway. Big missed opportunity there. We got to um, create that. I'm going to make <laughs> We're creating some merchandise. I'm told we're, we're doing it. We're it's yours. And then the other thing, like what you said, this is something I would actually do every step along my way. On the merchant side, you said you need to think like a fraudster. I would always have like our own like hack week because we're not technical and we throw ideas over the fence for when companies do hack week. But I think like a fraudster. It wouldn't be really a week, but it'd be like a day or two days that we do what we need to do to keep operations going along, but we would spend the remainder of the day, our meetings would be solely focused on that, of like brainstorm of how we're set up today and knowing how much you know, what would you do to abuse our company? And how could you do that? And why is, it, why is that the first thing or the easiest thing? Which then goes down to the direction of like, where's our vulnerabilities? You have the customer journey, where are black holes? Is it data that we don't have? Is it how it's set up that's allowing us to do this? Why? And start to answer those questions, which then goes down to what you were saying, Alex, of like data is key to help you there. But you might have more data than you actually realize. And this is a big thing that 
I help people with today of recognizing what data do you have? Just because you saw this marketing scheme that got you to say, hey, this is the best thing ever and it'll help you, the data you might have today might devalue what you're looking at tremendously. And it opens up the door for another provider to say, you know what, this is where our gaps are and this complements the data we have today. Uh, one piece of data that I'd actually like to use more is marketing data. Uh, marketing data, being able to segment and use the attribution of where is our traffic coming from? Where are your users coming from? Marketing typically has a lot of data and has segmented the users tremendously to be more fine-tuned. I've never actually, for the most part, had the luxury or have always had to have battle to get access to that data into my decisioning. Um, so then from there, then we start to understand what gaps in the data or what will help us make better, faster, accurate decisions, that being the key, and what do we do here? And that's then where you start to go out there and educate yourself and learn what other people are doing, what is out there. But that's why you need to understand that there isn't a one fit solution for everything. That's why educating of where you're at today can help you actually customize your own stack in itself of what is relevant to your day to day. And I advertised this discussion as a power packed panel. Listen to these gentlemen because the stuff that they're spewing out is gold that I use. Or for example, for example, Alex there with his think like a fraudster, that has become one of my daily mantras. Like you really, if, if you can think of it, they're probably doing it. And if they're not doing it on your platform, they're doing it somewhere else. You might as well take a look, see if it's happening. And you know, you may have a discovery. Thinking like a fraudster when it comes to this holiday season is why I'm thinking that these methods of fraud, like especially the triangulation fraud, is going to grow, right? As Brad mentioned, we're in that recession. People don't have the money, so they're looking for deals and discounts. And you can find this stuff right on Google. It's not difficult to find these offerings that, in a way, seem like they're shady. They are there. The fraudsters know that people are trying to save money, so they're setting up these shops and making it available to anybody to do. So thinking like a fraudster, that's going to be where I'm going to go. I'm going to set that up because it's easy. It's pretty much undetectable from my side. And I'm going to be making all this money from these people who don't want to spend quite as much money right now and are on the lookout, which is going to be a lot of people this holiday season. And as Brian mentioned, the data, absolutely get familiar with your data. <clears throat> Every once in a while, you might just want to do a mash, you know, have some ideas of information, mash everything together, grab it and see what you can find, you know, see how it connects to fraud that's going on your network see what looks suspicious, see what looks absolutely genuine. There are elements that you're gonna be surprised that you know you didn't even think that you could use. And there you go, it's right in front of you, simple aggregate, and you've got some very sound information that you can use towards your defenses. You guys both what? touched on the value of, of how to look inwards at your operation. And so with that, I quickly wanna go into uh, Two things that I that I dislike about the, the the overarching messaging that happens quite often, and that's characterizing characterizing words. What's the method that we hear the most? What is the method that is the best? These characterizing words, the most, the best, the biggest, the baddest, all these things. Yes, that's what's happening in the marketplace, and yes, that's important to be aware of. But you're only in you're only responsible for your operation your losses, your, your work is centered around your operation. So to both of your guys' points, when you look inward at your operation and you evaluate all of the touch points, consider that a fraudster will try to contact uh, the customer service team and try to place an order that bypasses all of the security on your website. A, a fraudster will try a, a dishonest consumer calls into your customer service line and says, hey, I ordered pink and I got blue, what the hey, give me a 200% refund, blah, blah, blah. Another fraudster will like, so you got to see at what point in your customer experience journey and at what touch point users can make changes to your operation. So be aware of what's happening out in the marketplace. And I know I kicked off by saying that track what's happening in the marketplace. 
but make sure you take the time to look inward and don't use these qualifying words. Set precedences, but make sure you put eyes on everything that you can, right? Um, that was it, the two things, characterizing and then looking at every touch point, yeah. To the touch yeah. points, I think it's it's also a lot of the times, and this is a challenge just for our industry, and this is kind of the challenge of like fighting the status quo internally for a lot of companies is we've talked a lot about different things and different stakeholders along the way, our partners, ultimately internally. Fraudsters don't care who handle what part of the customer journey. So the more siloed we are as teams, so that we like it's it's unrealistic for one team to handle the entire customer journey. But it, it is realistic to have good communication with your partners and stakeholders. And if you do not have good partnerships with your internal stakeholders, you'll be losing. You'll always be a step behind to the fraudsters, and there's no way you can be proactive to that if your communication is lacking internally. So the silos are natural, but collaboration is key to eliminating the silos or the risk of silos in itself. Yeah. And I think we, we've had some guests on the podcast that have really talked about how that requires a culture shift a lot of times internally, which can be really painful because you'll have people who kind of think of fraud maybe as something off in the distance or maybe kind of like the redheaded stepchild to the security team. And those are, those are the companies that are really leaving a lot out on the field. And we've even had some stories on the podcast where people have had fraud presented to them by people that they're paying to look at their operations and they still don't do anything to fix it because, oh, that's the fraud team. You know, they don't, whatever. So I would also add to that, be proactive, not just about breaking down those silos per se procedurally, but also culturally, of, of creating that communication as a fraud team out to the rest of the teams and broadcasting what you're doing and how your day-to-day -day is going and the value that you're delivering so that people see, hey, these people are, are really working hard. They're really um, bringing value to the company and that will help you along the way to get the marketing team, which would usually have absolutely nothing to do with fraud on their radar. If you build that culture, uh, you know, with a weekly uh, coffee with someone or something and say, hey, we would really love to have your data through X and Y and Z filters. That, that's where you're going to be able to make those, make those procedural connections. It starts with the culture that your company has at the top and how your fraud operations are perceived. Yeah, and you yourself, you're going to have to become multilingual because all the different pillars speak different languages. You know, you may talk fraud, but finance talks figures, ops talks experience, and et cetera, and et cetera. So you're going to have to take it on yourself to learn how to speak to your audience. I love that you took my fraud as a foreign language spiel. Um, but I will say, even on the selfish level, all of us have jobs. And there's a reason why we have jobs. I will say education is... Sorry, Brian, one second. Alex has to drop off. Um, okay. He's a very, very busy man. And uh, he, he, has, uh, he has a hard stop here. So Alex, thanks so much for, for joining us. Thank you. You guys are all awesome. This is an honor to be on here with you guys. You guys rock. Keep it going. All right, guys. Take care, man. Sorry, finish up, Brian, and then we'll, All good. Uh, we'll close it down. Uh, it's the last bit, even just for me. Uh, for me, what really unlocked a lot of career growth for myself is actually fighting less fraud. It sounds counterintuitive, but educating more around what is fraud, the impact of fraud, the customer experience. The more I actually got out of my comfort zone and started talking and sharing and making it digestible in a language that people understood in their world, I grew faster in my career. I thought hoarding information of, all right, I'm going to do this and the business won't have to worry about this because I've got this, held me back and I grew way slower. And they would just come to me and be like, wait, we have a fraud problem now? What's What have you been doing for X amount of months? We thought everything was good. We didn't know you existed. And then it was like that moment was very hard because I had to do all the education in a point where there's a lot of focus 
and visibility on the function in itself. So that education and communication helped me kind of level set with a lot of people of when I needed a new tool, when I needed more data, I didn't just show up and say, hey, I expect everything now. All those conversations have been in motion for a while. Um, and you get better at learning how to talk. You get better at communicating. You get better at understanding how you're actually being perceived by engineering, by product, by marketing, by CS, whoever it may be. Speaking their language, you just get better and better, and it becomes easier and easier to have those conversations. And I think we'll leave it at that. Brian, Sean, thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate your time. If you guys want to let everyone know where they can find you uh, before we sign off, if uh, you want to give them your contact or, or um, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm the fraudalist. Uh, so basically, you can find me on LinkedIn slash the fraudalist. Uh, email is basically the same at shaw.ca. LinkedIn is the best way to find me. Everything I do, I've been trying to communicate, educate. That I mean, at the bare minimum, my mission and why I've joined Dodgeball is just to make fraud fighting easier for our community. That's it. So you can find me on LinkedIn um, is Brian Davis 21, or it's easier to just find me as the bald fraud fighter, bearded brand, brand protector, or the tortilla chip addict. Can't hide who I am. <laughs> and uh, we hope you'll continue to check us out on merchantfraudjournal.com. We have the podcast. We have uh, the, the webinar series that we do. We have a LinkedIn page. You can check us out. Um, we really appreciate all the all of you guys jumping in. Thank you, everyone. Um, hope everyone who got the mugs and the chocolate enjoys. We'll be getting those packages out. And we hope to see you all at the next event. So thanks so much and take care. Thank you, Bradley. Thanks again. Cheers, everyone.